Dr. Stephen Thayer, welcome back to Psychedelics Today, second time on the show, but here for Vital Psychedelic Conversations. So excited to have you back on to, to chat. Thanks, Kyle. Yeah, I'm excited to be back. Yeah. So um, as mentioned, uh, before we got rolling here, we kicked this series off with uh, a question. And that question is, what do you think uh, is the most psychedelic conversation people should be having right now? Yeah, I think there are a lot of important conversations that we should be having around psychedelics. Um, and I think the probably one of the most vital ones is around integration. Mm-hmm. You know, I, 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 uh, I, I do ketamine assisted psychotherapy primarily. And that's the kind of primary, pri- primarily, um, primary psychedelic treatment that we offer. Um, but I've worked with, um, uh, on clinical trials with other substances like LSD and, uh, well, LSD is coming up, but, um, psilocybin, um, and everyone gets really excited in my experience about the medicine, right? What can psilocybin cure my depression? Can, you know, can ketamine cure my trauma? Can MDMA make me whole again? And these medicines do incredible things, absolutely incredible things. And I'm so excited about the research that's happening to, uh, get a sense for, how these incredible things are happening, how we can leverage these incredible things to help people heal. Um, but it, it kind of dovetails with just my general criticism of, of putting psychology and psychotherapy into the medical model. And that is people come to the doctor for the cure right. and they just sort of expect the medicine to do the work. The medicine does a lot of work, but it doesn't do all the work. And so the way we kind of talk about that in, a, I feel like in the, the psychedelic medicine space is with this word integration, but what does integration really mean? A lot of times when you ask a therapist or, you know, a clinician or a guide or a healer, somebody who works with psychedelics, what do I do for integration? There's a few recommendations around basically just good mental hygiene. You know, well, you should be exercising. You should spend time in nature. You should journal. You should practice a mindfulness meditation. You should go to yoga. And these are all great recommendations. Um, but I think we need to offer our clients a little bit more in terms of integration. And I feel like we can offer them more when we really pay attention to and get really detailed about what we mean when we say psychedelic assisted psychotherapy, that's different, right? That's different than doing mushrooms in the woods with your buddies. That's different than, you know, going to a festival. This is combining the power of psychedelics with a specific mindset in a specific setting coupled with a particular therapeutic approach. And so I think talking about integration in terms of, um, you know, h- how are we setting expectations for the therapy that's happening with psychedelics? You know, like I said, they're not doing the work for you. And then uh, working toward change after the psychedelic experience with guidance from a professional helper. Yeah. How do you define integration? Like what does integration mean to you? I think in a literal sense, we're trying to integrate whatever the experience um, had on offer for us into our day-to-day life, right? That's one way to think about integration. I went on this crazy psychedelic trip. There are some things I don't fully understand or comprehend. I need to work on understanding and comprehending them and then integrating them into my life. And as a therapist, right, people come to me because they want help basically to change in one way or another, right? And so to integrate in that sense is how do I take whatever I experienced or whatever I learned and apply it to the change process? So if I, if I experienced unity with God consciousness, what the hell does that even mean for me <laughs> yeah. in my life moving forward? And if I came to therapy with, you know, some depression where I felt disconnected, and like my life was meaningless, well, it might mean that um, I'm more connected than I thought I was, that life can have more meaning than I thought it could. So integration then becomes, how do I integrate this new experience to this particular issue so that I can change? And I guess, like, how would you help somebody create that change? Because I think that's where people can sometimes get tripped up. It's like, how do I, how do I actually integrate that? Like, you know, I heard you talk about kind of just general self-care, right? And I think a lot of people do define integration as 
going out in nature, doing yoga, doing meditation. Um, and I like to kind of try to look at that as like, yeah, those are generally good self-care practices. It can help you get grounded, maintain some, you know, harmony within the system. But yeah, how are you helping people um, work through change and to be able to bring those insights down into the body and, and create that in their daily life? Yeah, it's the right question, right? How do we specifically do this? Because like your physician might tell you every time you go in for a checkup, well, you should be eating well, moving more, sleeping well, you know, socializing, that kind of thing. These are basic, like we were talking about, physical and psychological hygiene activities. But how would I help somebody integrate? It has a lot to do with their goals for treatment. This is why I was saying it's like, this is different. Psychedelic assisted psychotherapy is different than just taking psychedelics for fun or, um, you know, taking them even on your own. I mean, you can do a lot of incredible healing on your own. You don't necessarily need some, you know, guy with, with a degree, um, to tell you how to, how to heal. Right. Um, so we don't want to be presumptuous here, but if you're going to come to somebody for something that's called psychedelic assisted therapy, then we have a case conceptualization, right? I have a sense based on the way I approach mental health care and my particular theoretical orientation or the therapies I've been trained to use, the therapeutic tools I've been trained to use for why you might be feeling the way you're feeling or why you might be stuck in the way that you're stuck. And so that would inform what I then do to help somebody integrate. So, you know, for somebody like I was saying, who's very, very depressed and maybe their, their depression has a particular flavor of self-loathing, then we might set intentions around self-compassion and explore that during their ketamine experience, for example. And then if anything about self-compassion popped up, then that's what they're going to seek to integrate. You know, if they had an experience of seeing themselves for the first time as a lovable entity, then, all right, let's build on that. Let's try to integrate that. Can you, if we're going to do meditation, can you do a meta or a loving kindness meditation directed at yourself every day between now and the next time we meet? Can you journal about this experience? Can we do a little bit of parts work where, you know, you can address the part that you think is so unlovable with this new insight from higher self, you know, wisest self energy that you then had an experience with during your ketamine experience. So it's, and I'm kind of rambling, but it's, it's informed by your theoretical approach as a professional helper. And then, um, which, uh, that informs the kinds of activities you might suggest to a person for integration. And what are some of your theoretical orientations? You know, Kyle, I've been on quite a journey. <laughs> when it comes to Changing. theoretical. Yeah, you know, I, I started in graduate school being, a lot of my supervisors were very uh, client-centered, Rogerian, um, very humanistic. And so I developed um, a lot of love for helping people trust their sort of inner healing intelligence or the, the process of self-actualization. You know, I got really good at reflective listening and not giving people advice. And uh, then I joined the military. So I started my career after graduate school as a psychologist in the U.S. Air Force. And the Air Force medical culture was, was less about trusting the inner healer and more about you come to the doctor, you get your prescribed treatment, you get back to duty kind of thing. So there I, I, I uh, sort of flexed my muscles as a cognitive behavioral therapist, learned how to provide cognitive processing therapy and prolonged exposure for PTSD, some of these more manualized structured treatments that were more cognitive based and found a lot of uses for that. But then after I got out of the military, I, I sort of rediscovered my love for emo emotion focused therapy and acceptance and commitment therapy. So EFT and ACT. Um, and, uh, and now as I've, you know, developing this interest and expertise in psychedelic assisted therapy, I'm, I'm kind of back where I started with humanistic approaches, trusting the inner healer, but giving people some structure to that. Yeah, that's what does that look why, like? Yeah. It's one of the reasons why I like act because I feel like act is a good combination of sort of these Eastern mindfulness type stuff that Western psychology sort of co-opted from these ancient wisdom traditions. Um, it's a good combination of the mindfulness stuff and the, the sort of trust that self-actualization and transcendence will happen if given the right therapeutic uh, positive regard and, and good environment. Um, and these good cognitive skills, like don't believe mm. everything you think. Right. Uh, let's challenge some of these distortions. 
and let's um, get you out there and actually do things that make you uncomfortable. You know, let's let's um, reduce experiential avoidance. So I think it's a good marriage of the two approaches. Something random is kind of popping up by just hearing you talk about trying to marrying these two. Do you see any, I guess, like maybe harms that could come up if you're too humanistic, person-centered, following the inner healing intelligence? Um, like, I'm just thinking, you know, I, I definitely take that 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 stance, right? I feel like that's really mm -hmm. where I come from, that kind of Grothian. Let's really focus on that inner healer. How do we cultivate that relationship and trust that? But you know, I feel like some clients come in and they really need some expertise, right? They're like looking at you for that. And I mm -hmm. sometimes feel uncomfortable with that because I'm like, you have this inner healer. Let's really focus on that. But, um, you know, being more directive at times, is is it should is there a place for that um, as you're starting to kind of look at maybe, you know, marrying these kind of two two worlds? Um, yeah, I think there is a place. I'm, I'm very, I'm very uh, cautious about being the authority in the same way that like, if you go to your surgeon, and they say, all right, this is what I'm going to do, I'm going to fix you. And then you go and do this physical therapy afterward. I don't feel like mental health professionals, uh, that, that we ought to approach our, the care of our clients in the, in the, in the same way. Right. Um, that being said, they're coming to us for help, right? We do have an expertise. We do have training. We, we, it, like we got our, our degrees for a reason. We have our theoretical approaches, most of which are based on good science for a reason. So I remember in graduate school, I was doing my reflective listening thing and I was, you know, an amateur at it. I was being supervised and I was doing a good job of it. And we were watching the videotape of this session with this guy who was very depressed. And my supervisor just sort of looked at me. He said, Steve, this guy's coming to you for help. What are you offering him? And I was just kind of sat there and well, I'm offering him, you know, compassion and, uh, I'm listening to him and I'm validating him. Um, and my supervisor was like, yeah, I see all that, but he's not changing, right? He, he, he wants help. Can you help him? Um, and this is all very debatable, right? There's right. plenty of, of uh, client-centered purists who would say that I'm giving him precisely what he needs. I'd, maybe I just need to do a better job of that. And then I, you know, I had a supervisor who was very uh, into CBT who would say that, yeah, the reflective listening stuff and the positive regard and compassion is just the substrate. It's the foundation, but you got to build like they, they, they need actual help, you know, quote unquote, actual help as if those things aren't actual, they, they are. But so I think there is a good case to be made about, um, you know, giving our clients some structure. And that's maybe why I think integration is such a vital conversation to have, because a lot of the structure maybe comes around that. Uh, than it does around this is what you ought to do to navigate a psychedelic experience. I think we could probably be more hands off because hmm. we don't really know what's going on <laughs> during the psychedelic experience. Yeah. We've, we've got our predecessors who experience who worked with this medicine a lot, and we've got the ancient traditions that have been using plant medicines and altered states for thousands of years that we can learn from. And then we have a little bit of empirical research here in, in the modern era, but. To say that, that that gives us the authority to say like, well, we know exactly what's going on when you take this much of psilocybin or this much of LSD and this is exactly what you should do to navigate that experience would be, you know, unbridled hubris. Uh, so I think we should remain humble and trust the inner healer and then during integration do our best with the skills that we have um, and the best evidence that we have to give people suggestions on how they might move forward. Awesome. Yeah. And to, I, I think I've mentioned this quite a few times on the podcast and, and elsewhere. So people have probably heard it before, but I always come back. To, I think it might have been in the book, Holy Breath Breathwork, and our teacher Lenny has mentioned it. But um, it's a great example that we don't know what's going on. Facilitator kind of stepping in, thinking a person is going through the birth process. And then during the group share, they were a Viking warrior dying on the battlefield, right? And so <laughs> even though we can like assume, oh, they're, you know, they're curling up in a fetal position. They must, having that theoretical orientation, they must be going through the birth process when mm -hmm. really, you know, it was a totally different experience. And whenever I hear that story, it's a good reminder. Even though it lo it may look intense, it may look like something's going on, we don't always know what's going on in the, in the person's inner world. Um, right, right. So I like to start with trusting 
that inner healer, assume I don't know what's going on. And then once I've, I've sort of evoked from the client some details about their experience and um, how it might jive with the issue they've brought to therapy, I think that's when you can get a little bit more directive. Like, okay, well, you said that you experienced depression. It's related to this belief that you have that you're unlovable. You had this experience during your ketamine trip um, of loving your your younger self. Now we can roll with that. Here's some suggestions on how you might build on and integrate that. I heard you talk about um, parts work, and I know that has been a very popular uh, orientation, especially now within the psychedelic um, kind of therapy community. People seem to love IFS. Um, do you mm -hmm. have any training in that? And like, what do you think about that that approach? I do have a little bit of training. Um, you know, I, I've read uh, a lot of Dick Schwartz's books and then I, I participated in their like level one circle. Um, it's not the, the level one official training, but I do like it. It's, I think one of the reasons it's so popular, it seems like, uh, well, you know, Dick Schwartz was interviewed by Tim Ferriss and then uh, IFS kind of blew up. I mean, it's always, it's been around for a long time, of course. He's done a lot of hard work, but also IFS doesn't have a, a monopoly on parts work. Um, right. Parts, parts work is, is integral to a lot of different kinds of therapeutic approaches. I think um, it just pairs really well with psychedelic work. A lot of people experience um, sort of their parts when they go through a psychedelic experience. And it's, it's a great, I think it's just a great frame around which to wrap integration. Um, and if I remember right, it's, it's been uh, kind of the the theoretical approach that the MAPS MDMA uh, PTSD manual is based. Very trust the inner healer type of manual, but um, you know there's 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 talk of, of parts work and that kind of thing. Yeah, because I think Michael and Annie had training in it, um, and that's mm -hmm. I think where some of that came from. And I frankly like when I'm trying to manage my own mental health. Um, parts work is just the the most effective way for me to do it. Like my own self care, right. using that, that way of addressing myself uh, and trying to be self led, you know, that capital S self led has, has been the most effective. And I've tried a lot, tried a lot of different approaches. Yeah. Yeah. Um, I want to come back to something you mentioned and um, actually uh, Dr. Rick Strassman kind of uh, talked about it a little bit um, yesterday in, in our vital program. Um, and I wanted to follow up and ask him this, but you know, you're kind of talking about people come in and they are putting a lot of focus on the substance um, and something uh, Rick brought up was around research with psychedelics, kind of talking about the placebo effect. And it's like, typically we kind of know when somebody's on um, a, a drug. Um, and it got me thinking just around drug research in, in general, where you know, you're trying to see if a drug works. And it seems like a lot of emphasis is on the drug. And he said, well, why, why aren't we doing psychedelic assisted therapy versus say CBT. We're really analyzing the, the therapy versus the drug. We know somebody is on a drug typically. So why aren't we kind mm -hmm. of comparing to psychedelic assisted therapy work better than say CBD ther CBT therapy? Um, you know, I get it from the FDA approval. You know, we need to kind of do this, this basic drug research to um, see the efficacy around it. But it brings up an interesting point around, it does seem like a different kind of paradigm that we're trying to use a substance in conjunction with psychotherapy and measure the effect of the, that therapy versus the dr it's just the drug doing all the work in like say regular psychopharmacology. Yeah, I think those are all really important empirical questions that need to be answered eventually. And like you said, I get why we're starting with just sort of trying to understand if if the medicine itself is having, um, you know, having the effect that we hope it has, but um, or hypothesize it might have. I think psychotherapy research is really hard to do just generally like comparing certain therapies to the, to others. It's really tough to, to say um, what the active ingredients are, you know, I, in graduate, graduate school, I did a little bit of psychotherapy outcome research and um, you know, what, what we observed was that the, what, what are often called the common factors. These are the, the factors that are present in just about any therapeutic session, regardless of orientation, account for most of the variance, like account for most of the change in people. And that is a warm presence, a good working alliance, trust, 
um, someone who listens well, you know, those kinds of things that regardless if you were doing EMDR or CBT or, or whatever are likely to be present. And the degree to which those are present have a lot more to do with whether or not the client reports positive outcomes than the particular approach you use. Sometimes that's disorder dependent, right? If I have a specific phobia, then I'm going to need to likely do exposure and response prevention and uh, that's going to work best. But I'll be really curious to see once we can get that nuanced and we, and we can say, we can, you know, can, like you said, compare psychedelic assisted psychotherapy to psychotherapy by itself or just the medicine itself without the therapy component. I don't know how you'd structure a study like that, but you know, with somebody who just has a trip sitter who offers just safety support and they have no integration sessions or something like that. Right, right. A lot of lot of uh, research ahead of us. So if you're listening, yeah. maybe you can take this on if you're a student or somebody in a program. Um, I'm curious. And there's, there are so many interested students too. Like I, yeah. I get people reach out to me all the time and go, how, how can I become a psychedelic therapist? How can I get involved in psychedelic research? So yeah, there's... There's a bright future, I think, ahead for those of you who are interested. And I guess since we're on that topic, do you want to give any general advice? Yeah, so there is there are communities that are forming. There's If you Google it, there's one called Psychedelic Grad. Um, and that's a good community of people who are in school uh, or wanting to get into school to become psychedelic you know, mental health professionals of one form or another. Uh, and graduate schools are starting to develop at least seminar courses at the very least, and sometimes entire tracks around transpersonal or at least, um, or psychedelic assisted therapy. So I'd say gobble up podcasts like yours and, uh, I'll shamelessly plug my and yours podcast, too. Yeah. Yeah. That I, I host with, um, Dr. Reed Robison called, we call it psychedelic therapy frontiers. Um, there's lots of good content out there and gobble up the research. And then really just, if, if you know, you want to become a psychedelic assisted therapist, become a good therapist first and <laughs> you can get training on the psychedelic medicine later. But for me, I'm biased cause I am a psychotherapist. I think, um, you know, becoming a, a really skilled, competent therapist is, uh, really going to be the harder thing to do than it is to learn how to work with these medicines. Yeah. And I always like to ask people, um, do you see yourself wanting to do therapy without the psychedelic? Right. Um, cause that's going to be a big part of actually providing that therapy. And when we're thinking about integration, um, I wanted to ask you like, how do you provide integration or do you provide integration in your practice? And what does that look like? Like a client comes in, they have like a ketamine session. Do you, do you follow up X amount of ketamine sessions, X amount of follow-ups? Like, do you have a protocol? Yeah, we do. We um, And our protocols are changing. We're still kind of in the process of this acquisition by Numinous. So, um, you know, our protocols are evolving and changing. But oftentimes I've, I am enrolling clients I've had for a while, psychotherapy clients I've had for a while into ketamine assisted therapy um, because they're interested, because I think it might help. And so, you know, we'll have a course of maybe one to three ketamine sessions um, over the course of several months, depending on their needs. This is kind of my bespoke custom cap approach for some of my clients. So it might not be the standard they get if they called and scheduled an appointment, but, um, yeah, I just try to, to, to do ketamine assisted sessions, uh, in a way that makes sense for their treatment plan, for their needs. I, I think one thing we should be cautious about is giving people more psychedelic experiences than they need, right? Um, you can get a lot out of one ketamine experience if you're willing to be really reflective and spend time with integration. It's very different than, you know, the, the sort of standard IV model of ketamine that you might get at some, some clinic uh, that maybe isn't run by mental health professionals where you get your series of six and they send you on your way uh, right. with a pamphlet or something. But yeah, we, we uh, come up with a custom integration plan for each client, de- depending on the problem they brought to the session and what their individual needs are. And, uh, and then we might schedule follow-up ketamine sessions if they feel like they need them. And I'm hearing you say introducing ketamine to clients that you already see. And so it sounds like you're already doing psychotherapy with people versus just coming in for, for ketamine uh, sessions. Right. Yeah. I mean, I was, I was 
in private practice for several years before I joined uh, the company I'm with now. So I, I brought with me a caseload of people okay. that I've been helping for a while. And um, and some of them were good candidates for CAP. And uh, yeah, for some of them, it's it's made all the difference. It's part of what kind of has converted me <laughs> to, to want to you know, bend my career in the direction of psychedelic assisted therapy is I've just seen its power to help people yeah. transform. Yeah. Yeah. And part of the reason why I was asking and just for clarifying purposes is just thinking about like accessibility and scalability. And so, you know, I know the way that I operate is really just introducing it to clients that I'm working with. And it seems more custom to some degree, like really working on goals and figuring out where somebody is at, introducing um, the ketamine in as an adjunct to therapy. And so it's not necessarily like a protocol. It's a little bit more kind of like customized in, in relationship with the prescriber working together versus some people do have those protocols. And it's like you're coming in specifically for these ketamine sessions, maybe with like one integration session, two integration sessions. Um, and I feel like maybe that longer term approach for some people, yeah, it's hard to scale that um, to some yeah. degree. Um, I think there's space for both ways of approaching it. And I, I think you're right about scalability, which is why I think when I look at Numinous and what they're what they're doing, um, I, I think they have a pretty good scalable protocolized approach where, you know, you come in and we are we are one chapter on your healing journey. And you don't have to be in therapy for six years with one of our therapists, right? It's you come in and have uh, several preparation sessions, and then you have a series of maybe three. I haven't, I don't remember exactly how this works for Numinous, but it may be three ketamine sessions that are spaced out with integration sessions, right? And then you have some some closing sessions, and then maybe it's a, a total of ten or something like that, right? And that, that way we can get the medicine to more people. We don't burn our clinicians out uh, by overloading them. And we also don't um, spread care too thin, right? The last thing we want is people seeing their clinician for a cap session and then not being able to get in to see them again for two months. That's just bad care. Right. Yeah. Yeah. So that's exciting. Sounds like you guys are putting together some more protocols. Um, yeah. Moving in that direction. Yeah, um, and group work. You know, it's something we talked a little bit about on when I was on here last with Reed uh, is group ketamine. So to just in, bring the price down for people, increase accessibility. And groups uh, are have some unique benefits that individual therapy doesn't. Can you give any examples? Well, you know, I... In, this is the case in, I think, regular group psychotherapy, but especially the case in psychedelic group psychotherapy. There are things that a group member can get from another group member that they that they can't get from the group facilitator or the therapist. You know, if you compose the group well, and in our groups, um, the groups we've run with ketamine, they've been for frontline healthcare workers who've experienced distress in response to the COVID pandemic, and we call it frontline cap. And uh, when they're in there with other healthcare professionals, they're battle buddies, you know, um, that that can relate to them and the kind of distress they've been through. Then, uh, and they're in this sort of shared altered state. They they connect and they get a, co a cohesion that you really it's just hard to get one on one with an individual therapist. So, I think that's one thing we leverage the power of community in a group, community, shared understanding, shared experience and, and, and validation. Yeah, and I think there's also something to that peer support too. Like people may feel a little bit more validated or heard at times um, mm -hmm. than maybe kind of like projecting that expertise onto the clinician or therapist. Um, I, I know when I've been in groups, it's felt that way, right? It's like, oh, here's someone yeah. I can just generally connect with versus like the, the therapist or whoever's in charge. I'm like, yeah, kind of doing my own projections there. Yeah, totally. And I think it's really, you know, some of my clients um, have told me, man, I've had this really profound experience on ketamine and I don't know who I can talk to in my life about this. I want to share it, but how do I explain to somebody that my body melted and I was God mm -hmm. and like all this stuff that sounds so weird, but when you're in a group and you've got a few other people experiencing it with you that you can then share it with, I think it helps with integration too. Like mm -hmm. here are other just regular old people I don't, I'm not getting this recommendation from my therapist. I'm seeing my group member buddy over here melting and then reforming and then, you know, integrating this into his life. 
Yeah. Are you, I guess, what, what are some integration challenges that you've bumped up against as a, uh, as a therapist? With ketamine, sometimes uh, I've had clients who, you know, they had the antidepressant effect. It's probably the neurochemical antidepressant effect of ketamine, but they didn't have, they didn't experience much. Mm. So for clients like that, it's it's often difficult to integrate because they don't really know what to say about their experience, right? Oh, it was just kind of black, or I, I just kind of felt disconnected. Um, I found that to be less the case with the other psychedelics. Uh, just ketamine can have this effect, you know, some people just, just dissociate, uh, or especially if they have a pretty high dose and they just fall off the cliff into the K-hole and there's not much to bring back. We, I mean, it's all, that's very rare, very rare to happen in the therapeutic setting, but some people are extra sensitive to the medicine. Yeah. Um, so I think that's a challenge. And then sometimes for some people they have, they do have a pretty euphoric <clears throat> or really special experience. And then they get back to uh, their shitty lives and with their, their crappy social support and um, it dissolves pretty quick. So people with really bad support uh, or just yeah. like either no support at all, at all or really a lot of toxicity in their lives, I think that's a particular integration challenge. And do you screen for that beforehand or just try to like understand what those supports are and maybe let people know that... You know, you might be able to get the antidepressant effect from ketamine or psychedelic, but yeah, what happens when you go back to your environment? Um, that's sometimes psychedelics don't always change that part of your life. Right? right. We try to have empowering conversations with our clients who have environments like that. Like, you know, is there anything we can change about the environment? Are there relationships that need to change? Can you show up differently in a relationship? Um, because, you know, we want people to have a supportive other when they go through our ketamine assisted therapy protocols. We do try to screen for that, but there's only so much, so let's be, let's be real here. There's only so much you yeah. can learn from a screening call from a spouse totally. or yeah. a parent or something that they could easily put on a face or just seem fine. So we do our best, uh, knowing that our best is never going to be perfect. And I think we, we also try to set appropriate expectations at the beginning of treatment. Like, you know, this, this, there's no such thing as a panacea. Like you said, it's not going to, it's not going to uh, change what happens at home, but it might give you a new perspective on life, new perspective on your problems and an opportunity to be different in your life. So try to do that yin yang balance of, um, you know, you are lovable and, uh, you also need to take charge and make some changes. Yeah. So I heard a little bit of like integration challenges on the client end. I'm wondering what type of integration challenges you've kind of like butted up against. And, may and maybe it's part of that is like, how do I deal with a client that didn't have an experience? But yeah, I don't know any personal challenges that, that you've had. I think th that is definitely one of them. Like I'm so it's, we have to check our own sort of biases as clinicians because we don't want that to, you know, any counter-transference to heavily influence the, our, our client's experience. But also, you know, if I am really hoping my client has this transformative experience and they come to and they say, you yeah, know, it's just kind of boring. And then I feel disappointment um, or I feel like, oh, crap, I, I recommended ketamine. It was the wrong choice. So I have to sort of track my own bull crap around stuff like that because I don't want it to, to affect them negatively. So that's been that's been a challenge for me, like when somebody doesn't have the experience I was hoping that they would have, I have to track that and yeah. be careful. And how, how, how do you work with that for yourself? Well, like I referenced earlier, I do my own little parts work. Like, yeah. uh, there's a part of me that really desperately wants to help people a lot. Right. And there's some, uh, that, you know, that part of me is compassionate and altruistic, but he also, uh, wants to be helpful because he feels like he's not good enough if he's not. So that's, right. you know, kind of the, the, the little shadow side to therapist Steve is if I'm not helpful, I'm not worth anything. <laughs> right. So, yeah, I kind of have to address him when he shows up in uh, a loving way just to, so he doesn't sabotage my work. Yeah. And do you still kind of have mentorship and ongoing supervision to help with any of this when it comes? Yeah, up? it's it's nice to work in uh, with a guy like Reed Robison. It's just, you know, really, really smart. Um, really compassionate, uh, really wise. So I, I staff stuff with him often. Um, I have a therapist myself 
that I work with. It's something I recommend to all of the people I've supervised or the clinicians I've taught that uh, you need to do your own work. Yeah. And, uh, you know, if it's really important to get supervision, but also just to get therapy. So I've worked with a therapist. I've also worked with coaches, you know, people who aren't licensed therapists, but they have expertise in the coaching world, um, for other types of, of challenges I want to overcome, but I'm a huge believer in helpers getting help. Yeah. It's so important. Um, and that's, I guess, kind of why I asked for those that are listening, where if you do have a lot of these issues coming up, if you're an integration therapist or coach, um, it's a nice reminder that, yeah, we need to continue to get support and, and do some of our own work and sit with some of that discomfort that, that comes up. Yeah. And we need to support each other. Like we yeah. need communities of, of, that's why I love conferences and I love trainings because I get to be around other helping professionals and we can support each other. Uh, hold each other accountable, but also support. Um, and also why I love these podcasts, man. Like one of the reasons we started Psychedelic Therapy Frontiers was to just offer free support, support to people yeah. who are interested in this world. And it's great, right? Being able to network with everybody and feel the support of the community. And then I'm sure, yeah, you receive lots of supporting emails from listeners too. Mm-hmm. It's mm-hmm. Like a, yeah, it's, yeah, it's humbling and I, and I appreciate it. Yeah, yeah. Um, so I know we wanted to also, I'm looking at the time and I feel like we could just keep going down different rabbit holes, but I, I, I know um, you mentioned um, that you wanted to talk a little bit about some of the caution, uh, cautionary tales in the underground. Um, and I wonder if you wanted to speak on that a little bit. Yeah. So it's interesting. Once when we started the podcast, got a, uh, some attention for being a psychologist who's into psychedelic assisted psychotherapy, doing both research and treatment. So I get a lot of people just locally in my life, in, in the community online, um, saying, Hey, you know, I, I really want, uh, it looks like psilocybin will fix all my problems. Uh, there's a dude I know who's got some, should I do it? You know, there's questions like that. Um, and then there's these underground communities. There's been really, really great underground, uh, therapists and shamans and guides and, you know, you know, pick your term, but people who work with the medicine, with a ton of wisdom and a ton of professionalism. It can be challenging to find a person like that, especially given the legal status of most of these things uh, in the United States and in Canada, around the world, what have you. Um, But yeah, I've noticed some really unfortunate fallout from people who, you know, they read Michael Pollan's book or whatever, they listen to the podcast, they hear Joe Rogan talk about DMT and ayahuasca, and so they go look for it. And, uh, I've known some people who've been really, really hurt. They've been hurt by, you know, at the very least by a guide who gave them the medicine and didn't give them much else, you know, no integration support. They've had their entire life flipped upside down by a really powerful high dose psilocybin experience. And now what, right? No integration support. Mm -hmm. I've also heard tale of, um, guides who will abuse uh, quite literally, you know, I've, I've, unfortunately I've had some clients come to me for treatment after experiencing sexual abuse at the hand of a psychedelic guide, um, experiencing exploitation. So, you know, a guide who, uh, was able to get a lot of money out of people because they would sort of incept them, give them a lot of psychedelics and they wouldn't tell them what the medicines they were giving them were, uh, had these sort of proprietary cocktails or whatever. And then was trying to convince them to hand over equity in their company and like things like that. So, geez, I just want to, to put the word out there. Like if you're interested in psychedelic healing, awesome. There are so many ways you can get that healing. If you want to be bold and do it in the underground, I'm not going to judge. I'm not going to tell you what to do with your life. Um, but you know, this is in the spirit of harm reduction. I think for those of us in this space that have decided to get, you know, licenses and, and do this all above board. Um, I think we, we have a, a, I don't know if I go so far as to call it a duty, but it, it's at least a passion of mine to, to try to reduce harm. So, Hey folks, yeah. you know, don't take medicine from somebody who won't tell you what it is <laughs> or make sure you have a support system. Make sure it's, you're not alone. Make sure somebody knows what you're doing, like that kind of stuff. I've heard this from multiple people throughout the years of, yeah, signing up for like a retreat and getting medicine that they have no idea what they're getting. Um, and the mm-hmm. guide or facilitator won't tell them. And that just blows my mind. It's like, yeah. what is going on there? <clears throat> um, 
yeah, yeah. that's a red flag right yeah and i guess if you are doing any kind of like that preparation work with people if people are reaching out like how do you approach um maybe these harm reduction conversations yeah i mean i i, I start with just you know because i'm a licensed psychologist i tell them i can't encourage you to do anything that's illegal so yeah uh, however, I do want to reduce harm in any way that I can. So not unlike, you know, the Zendo tent at Burning Man, uh, not going to necessarily encourage anything, but I will be there to help if you need help. And so, um, i I might just like say the same things I would say to them if I'm preparing them for a ketamine assisted therapy session. Like, uh, if you're going to do this, then make sure you, you are really clear why you're doing it and make sure you have an intention. And, you know, here are some things to look out for, you know, list off the red flags we just talked about. And, um, you know, if this is a friend, you know, it's, Hey, come back to me and talk to me. If this is a client, don't disappear on me, come back and let's have some follow-up sessions. I want to make sure you're okay. Um, or, you know, if, if they, if they're determined to do it and they say, well, Hey, well, how can I access psychedelics legally? Then I'd be happy to point them to the Netherlands or, you know, you could try cannabis somewhere where it's legal, or you could try a holotropic breath work. Like there's a lot of ways to access non-ordinary States without having to go to some underground person. Yeah. Yeah. Um, it's, it, I, I've it's heard so one. many, yeah. it is, it's, it's really tough. And I'm just thinking that like, you know, clients have reached out to me over the years and just people I've worked with. And, you know, I think I mentioned this, um, before we got recording, um, there's like that, that part of me that, that shows up when people are reaching out. And I think I've just heard so many horror stories over the years where it's like, am I being kind of a sourpuss the way I'm kind of just putting disclaimers out there um, to, to some folks around like this happens. And so be very careful on who you're doing, you know, medicine with. Um, right. And it's like, you know, am I trying to dampen their experience a little bit or what type of expectations am I putting out there? But I think, yeah, hearing a lot of these stories um, makes me think like, yeah, you know, these are, these can be very healing, but you know, it seems to attract certain facilitators, like a certain population around maybe like people that have narcissistic personalities, people that want to be a little bit more power hungry. Um, and it seems mm -hmm. to attract um, those types of personalities for, for facilitators and harm is done. Um, and we just have to be very, yeah. very careful. Um, so psychedelics can be healing, but they can also sometimes be pretty harmful depending on how you're doing them. Right. You know, we've heard them called non-specific amplifiers. And so if, if what they're amplifying is the ego of a facilitator and, you know, the, the suggestibility of the participant, then you've got a recipe for a disaster there. Um, so, yeah, I think we ought to be cautious. And I'm also, uh, I'm also well aware that just because I've been trained in a Western, uh, modern psychotherapeutic approach that I, I don't have any kind of monopoly on, on the wisdom it takes to heal. So like I was trying to say, there are plenty of guides who work outside the, this paradigm that I've been licensed within who I would be more than happy to send a loved one to that I would go to myself because I would want to learn from their wisdom. We, we haven't cornered the market on that. So I think it's important for us to be humble. When I say us, I mean, you know, those of us who chose to go to, you know, regular old graduate school and get licensed by a U.S. state. Um, important for us to be humble, but I think also, like we've been talking about, encourage people to be cautious. And you have to be cautious when you go see a licensed professional, right? We see that. So much harm in, happens. Yeah. Yeah. In, in the recent uh, controversy that's come to light with the, um, what was the name of their podcast? The uh, cover story. Mm-hmm. With, yeah. you know, with uh, the fiasco and of and, yeah, yeah. the maps and all the underground stuff with the ayahuasca communities. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So uh, proceed with caution, but uh, also proceed with excitement. We don't want to be the sour apple that you're talking about necessarily and <laughs> turn everybody off. But I think, uh, you know, be cautious as well. I'm still very optimistic, right? But yeah, yeah I, I think yeah. hearing these stories, it's, it's a reminder that healing happens, but also, yeah, harm can happen as well. And, you know, it's really who's, who's facilitating that and, you know, can you do a read? So how do you vet the people that, that you are working with? Um, and I'm, I'm glad to hear, um, you kind of just raise that, that point around not having a monopoly. Um, and I, I wonder, 
you know, if these medicines were more legal, decriminalized to some degree, maybe um, play, because I think people have a hard time reporting this as well when harm happens, right? How do you report something when you just engaged in an illegal activity in, in your state? Um, so I'm, I'm really interested to just see how some of the, as, you know, specific like Oregon, as, as they develop, um, being a little bit more inclusive. And I know some people have challenged that of thinking it really needs to just kind of be in the medical Western paradigm. But I'm also kind of curious to see how it unfolds when you know, a person with a high school diploma plus additional training. Um, I always like to think, you know, there are those people that have that healer archetype, right? They just mm-hmm. have those natural qualities, but maybe didn't have the privilege of going to grad school and being able to advance their career in that way. Um, and how many healers are maybe left out of the healing profession because they, they couldn't go down that path for whatever reason. Right. You know, and I don't know what the right legislative answer is for Oregon. Um, but I, I, like you, I'm very curious to see what happens. Um, but, uh, like I was saying about psychotherapy outcome research before, one of the findings of one of the studies was, uh, you know, they compared experienced psychotherapists with brand new psychotherapists and then just, um, non-professionals who happen to be kind of nice and good listeners. Mm. And the outcomes were very similar across all three groups. What they found was that the the more experienced therapist helped clients get to good outcomes a little faster, Mm. but that eventually, you know, on average, everybody kind of got to the same place. So uh, I think there is absolutely a place for just well-trained novices to uh, to come in and, and be very helpful for people, especially if it increases access to care. Yeah, there was a study one of my teachers kept pointing out and I have the book in my Amazon cart, but I can't think of it off the top of my head. I wanna say like Gerber, Garber and somebody else. Um, but they did, a, a, I think a similar study with therapists versus um, I think it was like a college professor um, and, mm. and their outcome, I think it was around like maybe depression, anxiety and um, the the outcome there was the person that saw the, the licensed professional um, described it with a little bit more clinical lingo, which is pretty funny. But yep, yeah, si- similar go. similar outcome um, to uh, around their, their healing process. So, um, all right. Well, I see that we have about 15 minutes left and there is another question that we typically ask and maybe this kind of can segue. I know we wanted to talk a little bit about training. Um, so what's the most vital teaching point that psychedelic practitioners um, need to become skilled and expert in? I guess to piggyback on uh, my point about integration would be mindful awareness. Mm. I think uh, for a psychotherapist, a guide, somebody working with psychedelics, it's really important that you sharpen that skill of mindful awareness. So, Could you define that a little bit if somebody doesn't know yeah, what that m- means? Mind- mindful in the sense that you are aware of what's happening in the present moment without judgment. So you can reflect on the emotions that are erupting in you or in your client to the extent that you can perceive them and the thoughts and beliefs that are, that are there as well. Um, and to hold them in mental space without judgment, you know, that's the mindful part. Um, and then awareness of them and you, because like when I was doing the clinical trial, most recent clinical trial we did with psilocybin, for depression, you know, you're in there for a long time. The way these studies are designed, it's, it's seven hours with a client and it can get tiring. It can even get boring, especially if they're having a very internal experience and they don't need a lot from you. And I just decided it was going to be really important for me. You could call it energetically or whatever, but to be focused on this client. And as a result, I, I picked up on some subtleties that I don't think I would have picked up on otherwise where I was able to kind of go to the person's side and maybe offer a one or two word encouragement phrase, like, you know, surrender, let go, lean in, that kind of thing. And the client reported afterward that that was really helpful. So I think it's really important to hone that skill just generally for your own mental well-being. But I think it's, it's especially important for therapists where our reactions to our clients are part of our instrument, right? It can be really good data for a client if we're feeling uh, sad or annoyed or distracted or bored or something like that. So I would say mindful awareness is a really important skill, um, just generally for life, but for, for helping professionals to sharpen up. 
Yeah, yeah, I, I tend to agree. And I think um, just, I, I guess, talking about education and training, um, like what type of training and education do you see that's like really important for people that wanting that want to enter uh, into this field? So what are maybe think, some of the, like the pillars? Um, yeah. Yeah, I think uh, there's a lot of good education popping up right now. You guys have great education program with the Vital Program. The places like uh, Fluence and Polaris and Psychedelic Dot Support. There's a lot of a lot of great places to get education. Um, we're creating a foundations. I mentioned this in, when I was on your show before, but um, a foundations of ketamine assisted psychotherapy course that people can find um, if they. I don't know what the URL will be later, but <laughs> right now it's cedarpsychiatry.com slash edu. Uh, but so to answer your question more directly, I think some foundational, you got to start with the basics. Uh, if you come to the training, having already been trained in psychotherapy, great. Um, or at least therapeutic strategies, but the basics of what are the medicines you're going to work with? You should probably understand them. You should understand them to the extent that we have understanding of them. How do they act in the brain? What are, how do they, how do people typically respond when they're on these medicines? What can we expect? And then how to prepare people, the sort of pillars of preparation, guidance, and integration. I think people ought to become really, really skilled in those three phases of treatment. Um, and then there are other pillars that uh, I think are especially, that lend themselves really well to psychedelic assisted psychotherapy. Um, Reed and, and Dr. Paul Fielking and, and Hannah Cross um, and myself came up with what we called the essential domains of psychedelic assisted psychotherapy. And um, they are emotions, cognitions, the transpersonal realm, um, parts work. Let's see if I can remember them all. Um, I think there was one more. Shoot. Mindfulness. There you go. That's cool. Sound like solid areas to focus on. Yeah. Yeah, they certainly cover a broad spectrum, but I think those are important areas to focus on understanding theoretically, philosophically, but also developing skill sets in. And this comes up pretty often, I think, when we talk about uh, education and training. Um, and should a person have their own experience, whether they're going into, say, psychedelic assisted therapy, or if they're actually doing integration work? I um, mean, I know that that's come up in, in a, quite a few areas, too. Does an integration coach therapist also need to have their own experience? with something to be able to properly support somebody through uh, their own integration process. I've heard a lot of different opinions on this. Um, so I don't know what the right answer is, but I, I guess I'll just offer my opinion. And that is if, so for, for cap, for example, should you have to have a ketamine experience to be a ketamine assisted psychotherapist? I think it is encouraged, but not necessary. I think we certainly could have very competent and helpful helpers who have never had an altered state in their lives, um, you know, provide ketamine assisted psychotherapy. That being said, because of it, it is a psychedelic experience is often so ineffable. It's just hard to describe. There's only so much training you can do to really know what your clients are going through. And it can be very helpful to know sort of, to the extent that you can, what your clients are going through. Um, for some of our clients, that gives them some confidence. Like we get asked that question a lot. Like, I'm, I'm about to do this weird medicine. Have you done this? Um, and, uh, you know, it's important to be thoughtful about how an answer to that question might affect a client. You could, If you have and you say yes, it could put them at ease. Or they could say, oh, wow, my therapist does drugs. That's weird. Right? You, we can't predict exactly how they're going to respond. Yeah. But yeah, I think um, it's been really helpful in, in my ability to be a CAP therapist. I've had my own ketamine treatment uh, for depression, but um, navigating ketamine, like especially uh, understanding ex my, with my own experience that ketamine experiences, if you've had one, you've had one, right? They're not all necessarily the same. Right. Could be said of any psychedelic, but... Yeah, any sort of experience, breath work too. You know, it's like, oh, mm -hmm. how, how many sessions? And whoa, everyone was so different. <laughs> yeah, it's humbling, right? I, I think I've used that word probably too much today. But uh, yeah, I think it, it's when, when you think you know what's going on, it gives you sort of a false sense of uh, 
a surety. And then I think that's when you start making these more, I don't know what you would call them, but decisions therapeutically that um, aren't trusting of the inner healing intelligence. And we can get a, l- a little ahead of ourselves. Yeah. I think I made this comment a few days ago to somebody, but um, just working with non-ordinary states in general, um, I think it made me makes me more confident in not knowing. <laughs> yeah, just just dealing with uncertainty. There, there's a lot of uncertainty um, in in this world, right? And it's like, how do we get comfortable with that to some degree of not knowing? I like that. That's been my experience with psych- my own psych- use of psychedelics too. Is that it's it's made me more comfortable with not knowing which is quite a journey for me because I started my life. It was very important to me to seek truth and to know the truth of things. And uh, to be more comfortable not knowing has been tremendously healing for me. And I think very challenging for a lot of people. And I think especially if that's like a new way of trying to be, especially I think we live in a culture that wants answers, right? I think, Mm -hmm. you know, we're a very cerebral, analytical, mind-oriented culture and we're always wanting answers to stuff. So not knowing, I think, is challenging for a lot of us um, because we're always trying to anticipate and and know. Um, So how do we pull back and sit with uncertainty a little bit? I think if the past few years hasn't taught us a little bit about uncertainty, um, it's hard to know what would. Yeah. (laughs) Right. Yeah. Well, just to kind of call back to ACT, that's one another reason why I really like ACT is, uh, you know, a lot of the things you're trying to help clients come to terms with with an act approach is that uh, their addiction to control is part of the problem Mm. and that surrendering and letting go is part of the solution. Mm. And what's the tenets of act for people that like don't really know, like what what are the pillars of act therapy? Well, you're putting me on the spot. I'm definitely not an act specialist, um, but it is, it is a nice combination of, of mindfulness focus and sort of cognitive behavioral principles from what I remember and kind of how I, I used what I've learned from ACT, but um, this idea that uh, ca- uh, that a lot of what causes what we might call mental illness or psychological distress is the result of cognitive fusion, where you sort of fuse together um, the words that form beliefs in your head with literal uh, reality. And so ACT is designed to help you do some, what Hayes, Steve Hayes would call cognitive defusion. So you're going to challenge the the reality or the literal nature of those beliefs like you might in CBT, but you're going to do it with a lot of metaphor. You're going to do it with mindfulness strategies, and you're going to work to develop more cognitive flexibility. Mm-hmm. So if something happens that r- flies in the face of your specifically tightly held beliefs, you can be flexible. You can update your beliefs. So you're moving from cognitive rigidity to cognitive flexibility. Wonderful. Thank you. Sorry for putting it on the spot there. <laughs> no, it's okay. But, uh, yeah. I was dredging it up from the memory banks. <laughs> uh, yeah, I'm just sure people are probably curious uh, hearing all these different uh, therapeutic uh, techniques and probably curious to explore. Um, yeah, I, whether it's IFS, uh, ACT, or um, emotion focused therapy. Um, yeah, all, all great tools. All right. Well, I'm seeing that we're about at time. Um, Anything that you want to close with or anything that we didn't touch on that you want to get into briefly? Uh, No, Kyle, I just really appreciate you um, having me on again. You know, I've been a longtime listener of this podcast and I've learned a ton from the professionals that you've had on. It's uh, an honor for me to be counted among the professionals that are uh, and other people who are working to sort of usher in the psychedelic renaissance. Um, I guess I'd like to let people know that, um, there's a lot of ways in which I'm, I'm trying to help and you can, you can find me on this, the psychedelic therapy frontiers podcast. You can also find me on, uh, Instagram, much to my own internal resistance. I am on, <laughs> I'm on Instagram, um, trying to, to help in whatever way I can putting out good information. So at Dr. Steve Thayer on Instagram. And then if you want to visit my personal website, it's just drstevethayer.com. And uh, the website is more sort of focused toward um, my coaching efforts and less to my psychotherapy efforts. So uh, awesome. helping people just sort of take their lives to the next level and um, solve intractable problems and a little bit of integration, psychedelic integration coaching there as well. Awesome. And if people were curious again around your introduction to ketamine uh, training, what was the website there again? Yeah, they can go to cedarpsychiatry.com forward slash edu. Awesome. 
Thank you. Well, it's been awesome. And yeah, second time around within a month or so. Uh, I don't know when this one's going to be coming out, probably pretty soon. Um, cool. Really great to just collaborate with you. It's been awesome getting to know you over the past uh, few few months. Um, so I, I really appreciate all your insights. And Thanks, uh, yeah, definitely everybody check out uh, their podcast as well. And I think you guys do some really good, nice little video sound bites. I think I've come across uh, your page there on TikTok and so you guys do a really good job with the, the video there. I don't know if you guys also do Instagram over there as well. Yeah, we have most of the clips are on Instagram. Um, and then, you know, we the entire episodes are on YouTube. We haven't had the bandwidth to put up clips on, on YouTube yet, but yeah, shout out to uh, our producer, Jamie Robison. He's done a really great job. Awesome. Yeah, they're very well done. All right. Well, Dr. Stephen Th- uh, Thayer, thank you for joining us, and we'll catch you next time, everybody. So take care.